in the church at Corinth, and not just there, but a lot of ancient places like Corinth, um, because people in Rome and Greek culture were polytheists, they worshipped all sorts of different gods and goddesses and idols and statues. And, um, they would People would make sacrifices to all these gods and then they would sell the leftover meat in markets. And uh, in fact, what would happen is that the meat that was left over would often just get bought straight from the temple. You knew for sure that that meat was offered to an idol. But sometimes the leftover meat would go to the marketplace and you, you didn't know where it came from. Well, best not to ask. <laughs> but this whole chapter is about this idol meat. It was a bit of an issue. Let's read. Now, concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. But if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he doesn't yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, the same is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eatings, the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol that no idol is anything in the world, and that there is no other god but one. For though there are things that are called gods, whether in the heavens or on the earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet to us there is one God, the Father, of whom all things are, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we live through him. However, that knowledge isn't in all men, but some with, conscience, with consciousness of the idol until now, eat as of a thing sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God, for neither if we don't eat are we the worse, nor if we eat are we the better. But be careful that by no means does this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to the weak. For if a man sees you who have knowledge sitting in an idol's temple, won't his conscience, if he is weak, be emboldened to eat things sacrificed to idols? And through your knowledge, he who is weak perishes, the brother for whose sake Christ died, thus sinning against the brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will eat no more meat that I don't cause my brother to stumble. There's been, believe it or not, a lot, a, a lot of scholarship on this chapter. And um, I wrote a, an essay on this chapter as part of my master's studies, and it was a big essay. I read a lot of scholarly opinions and articles on this, and I, there's no way to get into it. <laughs> but I'm going to say the very basic thing that I concluded from this chapter. And um, I'm going to give you an example um, using alcohol. So um, there's nowhere in the Bible that says don't drink alcohol. But there are places in the Bible that say don't get drunk. And um, so Christians around the world, all types of Christians are careful with alcohol. Now, some are very careful, like the Salvation Army, and some are less careful. And, um, but there's a clear line that gets crossed at some point with alcohol. And so there are all different perspectives. And um, in um, the 1800s, William Booth, uh, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, you know, he was out in London and he was preaching in the slums and people were getting saved. He was making converts and a whole bunch of these converts were alcoholics. They were, they'd lived in a drunken state for like years of their life and, you know, drunk up all their family's income and children were not getting fed. And, and as part of them getting saved, the Salvation Army decided to make a very hard stance against alcohol. And it's obvious why. You'd make that stance because it's a, the alcohol is a point of stumbling for all these people. So it's best to just avoid it completely, have nothing to do with it for the sake 
of all these people getting saved that were alcoholic. So the Salvation Army got really strict on alcohol and they just didn't have it at all. It was like a no alcohol rule in the Salvation Army church. However, there was another famous preacher in London at around about the same time called Charles Spurgeon. He's a Baptist preacher and um, in their churches, himself, Charles Spurgeon, was a drinker of wine. And he preached a sermon one day called, it was came out of the book of Song of Solomons. In fact, when I did my videos on the Song of Solomons, I quoted some of the things that Charles Spurgeon said. And his sermon, your love is better than wine. Because you know, in the Song of Solomons, there's the, the, the king and the maiden, and the maiden says to the king, your love is better than wine. Well, it's a picture of Jesus. Jesus is the king. And so Spurgeon preached this great sermon about the benefits of wine. You know, wine tastes great. <laughs> the wine makes you have a good feeling. You know, he give, talked about all the benefits of wine, but then he would compare it to Jesus and say, but Jesus, his love, the love of Jesus is better than wine. So in England at the time, you had these two different preachers. You had William Booth that looked at the alcoholics and said, they're struggling with this. We just have to avoid it completely no alcohol whatsoever. But the reason wasn't that the Bible said no alcohol. The reason was for their benefit. But Charles Spurgeon had a different congregation. He presumably didn't have any alcoholics in the congregation. He had an upper class or a, a more well-off congregation and he could preach how wonderful wine was but how Jesus was even more wonderful. And that's at the exact same time in London. Well, here... You can see how for the sake of the weak, the avoiding of something completely was necessary. This is with William Booth. The avoiding of alcohol completely was necessary for the sake of these people that needed to avoid it. And um, here Paul's talking about idle meat, meat offered to idols. And he's saying, we know that there's only one God. These idols, they're not even gods. You could literally eat that meat it would do nothing to you. <laughs> we know that's a fact. But if we don't have a regard for people, he says, we sin against Christ. Christ died for these people. And there are people in the church at Corinth who had come out of a polytheistic culture. They'd come out of this idol worshiping culture. They're trying to turn away from it. You can't go eating meat in front of them and saying, that's okay. You can't do it. You have, to, you have to say, I'm not eating that meat. Or, um, you know, maybe you might eat it at a time when they don't know. That's a different question. But you have to, and Paul says, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will eat no more meat. And so here's a passage that's talking about this meat that's offered to idols. You would definitely not go to the temple and buy it. Not that there'd be technically anything wrong with the actual meat, the meat could be fine, but you would not do it because it might cause your brother to stumble and you'd do it for them. And there are many things in our life like this and um, alcohol might be one of them. Like if you've got someone in your church that struggles with alcohol, well, you might put it away when you're around them so you don't harm them. I personally don't drink alcohol at all. My example, the example I set for the church is that I don't touch it. And um, there, are, there are things like that that you might decide to put aside, even though um, technically it would be okay, but you're mindful not of, not of morality in the sense of it affecting you, but morality in the, fen in the sense that it affects someone else. If you don't care about those other people, then you're not care that it's an attitude that's lacking in. Christian love. So this chapter, it looks like it's all about idol meat, but it's actually about Christian love and caring for those who are weak in faith or weak in a certain area or have a struggle in a certain way. And um, there are plenty of people, in fact, everyone has weakness in some area of their life. And we would never have got to where we were without other people being considerate of us. So therefore, be considerate of others.
Lord, I thank you for this chapter too. I thank you for Paul and this clear explanations of things. And I pray you'd help the church to be strong. Help us, Lord, with some of the questions that we have, even with things like alcohol. And Lord, I pray you'd help us as a body of Christ to always be mindful of others and how to lift them up in Jesus' name. Amen.